think it's worthwhile starting off by visiting why we thought that there was a need to better support people with their medicines. We know from national evidence that patients are notoriously bad at taking their medicines as we would like them to. I think the evidence says somewhere between 30 or 50 percent of patients don't take their medicines as, as we would like them to. And in fact, very, very few patients actually tell us that when they're prescribed a new medicine, they're taking it as we prescribe, they're having no problems, and they have as much information as they need. Now, clearly, this is costing us. It's costing us in terms of poorer outcomes from um, the treatment, but it's also costing us as commissioners in terms of unplanned hospital admissions. We know that somewhere between five to eight percent of all hospital admissions, unplanned hospital admissions, are somewhat related to medicines, and that rises to 17% in the over 65s. And I believe about 70% of them are thought to be avoidable. But also we spend an awful lot of money on medicines. I think I read somewhere that other than staffing costs, the NHS spends more money on medicines than it does on everything else. So clearly we're not getting the best return from that investment. In Lewisham, we spend about 50 million pounds on medicines, 37 million of that in primary care. And we waste so much of that medicine. I think the evidence says somewhere between four to eight percent of these medicines are returned to the pharmacies for destruction. But as we all know, that doesn't take account of the stuff that's in people's cupboards and quite literally going down people's toilets. So we thought we can do better. We need to do better. And I was charged for my sins for figuring out what was our pathway in Lewisham? How did we support people who had medicines related needs? And I started going a little bit mad. It took me weeks, if not months, to try and figure out what was happening. And in the end, I came to the conclusion it was because we had no defined pathway. There were so many people involved across so many teams. Some of them utilised some kind of formal assessment when they were trying to help patients. Others, mainly in health, we did it a bit more intuitively. But it didn't matter whether teams used assessment tools or not. The end result was always an MCA, a multi-compartment compliance aid. Blister pack to you and me, Dosset box, you all know what I mean on the Tuesday, Wednesday times down the side. That was an interesting journey because although we dished out an awful lot of these blister packs, when it came to discovering who was it who was suggesting that this was how best to help patients, the title of a famous song I think comes to mind, It Wasn't Me. Are there any GPs in the house? It wasn't you. <laughs> any pharmacists in the house? Wasn't you either. Wasn't district nurses. Occasionally people said patients asked for them, sometimes relatives asked for them. One thing most people were quite united on was that social care was quite a driver for the use of these boxes, but more about that later. Talking of social care, it became really quite apparent that we weren't talking to our colleagues in social care. Is anyone from social care here? Oh, it's a couple of people. <laughs> we had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> and I think some things that we were doing were having quite a serious impact over in social care, and some of the decisions being taken in social care had a huge impact on us and health, and we weren't talking. We also talked to patients in the early days. And what was clear was that patients just wanted a safe system that allowed them to remain in control and as independent as possible. Invariably, as we said, what they ended up with was one of these. Now, this was a collection of blister packs that ended up at my desk. It was picked up by a practice nurse who'd gone to visit somebody at home. I counted 48 blister packs there, nearly a year's supply, and you can see hardly of it was touched. So clearly, putting somebody's medicines in a blister pack, certainly in this gentleman's case, didn't help him at all. And the nurse said she just didn't have the energy or the capacity to pick up all the bottles of Gaviscon and the inhalers and everything else that was running around the house. So it seemed that another thing that patients were telling us was that they often didn't feel involved in the decision to get their medicines put in one of these blister packs. So it suggested a lack of decision making. And what was coming through loud and clear is that as professionals, we weren't always acknowledging the fact that patients may not 
always be able to or indeed want to take their medicines as we would like them to. So we knew that to make things better for patients, we would have to work across the whole system. So we partnered up with um, our colleagues in the London Borough of Lewisham and our colleagues in um, the Acute Trust. We wanted to develop a pathway, a pathway that identified people's roles and responsibilities right across the system, a pathway that ensured that people had a proper assessment around their medicines. And if that resulted in a blister pack, absolutely fine, but we needed to know that that solution was going to address the individual's needs. Um, and we also wrapped it up in a joint policy where we agreed that people had proper assessments and if they then needed some kind of pharmaceutical care plan that we could implement whatever support that looked like across organisational care boundaries. And so the Lewisham Integrated Medicines Optimization Pathway and within it the Lewisham Integrated Medicines Optimization Service was born. Thanks Cleo. So we don't have any analogies to aeroplanes, a small analogy to cars and that is a limo. Um, the team don't arrive in limos um, but I'm going to call it limos from now on because Lewisham Integrated Medicines Optimization Service is very long. Um, but this is, as Cleo alluded to, an agreed pathway and what this does is provide a specialist team of pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, it's quite a small team, who are based across the whole system. So some of them sit and face in secondary care and some of them are outward um, facing in primary care so that they can provide a specialist assessment for people who are identified as having medication-related needs. These people can be picked up and then followed up in any part of the system. So it might be that they're identified during a hospital admission, that might be my, my medic, or it might be by social care. But they can make a referral to the LIMOS team. The LIMOS team will provide an assessment, they'll put in a system to support that patient around medicines, and then as the arrow says, they follow them out into the primary care setting. But the converse can happen too. The idea, as we all know, is to keep people out of hospital. So when problems are identified in primary care, the assessment can play, take place in their own home, and hopefully they stay in primary care, but if they do go back into hospital, then that person is known to the system and can continue to be reviewed and anybody can refer. So it's not just hospital staff, it's social care staff, but also we have um, referrals from the third sector. So Age UK, there's all sorts of floating services in Lewisham's where people are su supporting people in their own homes and, and those people when they open those cupboard doors and find problems with medicines can make that referral. It's a challenge for everybody um, to know who to focus on. How do we find those at highest risk? Because obviously, you need to target those who do most need your support. Um, and these are the main groups. So anybody who has social care support in them around medicines administration, whether that be a new package of care that's going in or people that are already known to the service. Because the idea is if you have a specialist assessment, when the package of care is being designed, you make sure that it's fit for purpose and meets their needs. So for example, you might have people on medicines three times a day and without specialist input, a package of care might go in three times a day, whereas by rationalising medicines, we can make sure that the package of care is designed to, to meet the patient's needs. Um, again, transfer of care is known to be um, a really risky area, and specifically to care homes, we know these are often at highest risk, so they're a, a focal point for the service. We've got lots of ward pharmacists going around identifying people with medication-related problems, but that we also know, we're starting to know who the frequent flyers are, those people who keep bouncing back in, possibly due to adherence issues with medicines, um, can refer to the service and hopefully we can stop that process happening. Mental health issues, growing elderly population, lots of patients with dementia, increasing lists of medications, polypharmacy, people having pro memory problems, forgetting to take them. So again, this is another cohort we focus on. And then the housebound. Cleo touched on the fact that many people don't want to take their medicines as prescribed, but don't quite get around to telling anybody. The housebound can't access some of the standard services provided by community pharmacies. So this is sort of thing like medicines use reviews, which you may have heard about. 
So again, GPs in the audience might know those patients where you get into the home, you open the door, there's lots and lots of medicines there, and um, they perhaps just haven't accessed services as promptly as other people. So again, these are a target group. You might not be able to see the detail on this, but that's the very point of the slide. When we look at a patient and their journey with respect to medicines, there's so many people involved. There's all the different specialists in the hospital with long-term conditions um, growing, not sure that they always talk to each other, that the care plan is joined up. There's social care helping people, there's family, there's friends, um, there's community farms out there. But what limos do is actually enable a care plan to be formulated that join up all those people involved in a patient's care so that a care plan can involve not only the patient but everybody else that it needs to do to get to the end point. So, now, um, that's how limos works. What we thought we'd do is play you a story of Ivy, who we hope promotes the safe and quality care of patients in Lim Lewisham. Hello, my name's Ivy. I'm 82 years old. I have what my GP says are a number of long-term conditions, which includes problems with my breathing and arthritis, which has been getting really bad. I'm very well looked after by the NHS. I get to see so many specialists for each different problem. But the trouble is they keep adding to the list of medicines that I need to take. I'm sure these medicines do me good, but they also give me other troubles. But do you know, I counted up one day and I need to take 14 different medicines. But remembering to take 21 tablets per day I will admit I was beginning to forget to take some of these tablets. My friend says I should speak to my doctor about it, but I'm housebound and I find it difficult to get to the surgery. I don't even get to see my pharmacist anymore as they now send the delivery man round with me tablets once a month. I know they're trying to help. When my husband passed away a few months ago, a social worker came to see me as I needed a bit of help to get dressed and make my meals. I, I could tell she was worried about me not managing my medicines. I did have rather a lot lying around the house. She suggested putting all my medicines in a blister pack for me. I didn't realise what she meant by this until my next supply arrived from the pharmacy. I didn't really like the blister packs. I couldn't tell which one was the water tablet anymore as they were all mixed up in there. When I had a friend coming round and didn't want to go rushing off to the toilet, I didn't take my morning tablets. I also found it difficult to get the tablets out of the blister pack because of my arthritis in my hands. So I had to stab the pack with my kitchen scissors. I missed one day and got a nasty cut. The social worker came to see how I was doing. When she saw that I hadn't been taking all of the medicines, she said she'd organise for carers to give them to me. I didn't really want that. I wanted to keep my independence. It was the one last thing I felt I could do for myself, but I didn't want to seem ungrateful for the help that was being given to me. The care worker that came to see me was very nice. She put all my tablets into a cup for me to take. I tried to tell her that there were some tablets I didn't want to take because they didn't agree with me. But she told me I really should take them because the doctor had prescribed them for me and they would do me good. I didn't want to upset her, so I used to wait until she turned her back and slipped them down the side of the chair. I would have liked her to have helped me with my inhalers, though, because I found it difficult to push it down with my arthritis, but she said she didn't know how to, so I didn't use those either. Unfortunately, my breathing got worse, and one day I had to call an ambulance and was taken into hospital. While I was there, I met a nice pharmacist from the Lewisham Integrated Medicines Optimisation Service. Good job she called it the Lemos team for Shahut. She came to talk to me about my medicines. She was really easy to talk to and she had the time to listen to me. I felt I could be honest with her about how I felt about my medicines. I told her that I really missed not being able to be in control of the medicines I was taking. She talked to the doctors for me and changed the number of tablets that I need to take. 
This meant that most of my tablets could be taken in the morning, all in one go, with just a couple in the evening with my tea. I could remember that. She spoke to my regular pharmacist and arranged for my tablets to be put into bottles with lids that were easy to open, even with my arthritic hands. Now I have less tablets to take and I know what they're all for and I'm happy to take them. I felt the Lemos pharmacist had really listened to me and helped me take control of my medicines and all these illnesses that I have to live with. She made sure my GP and pharmacist knew about the changes that had been made in the hospital. She told me that another Lemos pharmacist would visit me once at home to check I was getting on all right. A few days later, after I got home, this lady came. I was happy to show her how well I was managing my tablets now. I still needed help with my inhalers, though. The pharmacist spoke to social services and arranged to show my carer how to help me. She also gave me information on how often I could use my inhalers so I don't panic when I feel a bit breathless. Now that I can manage most of my tablets on my own, my carer has more time to make me even nicer dinners. I now feel a lot better. It's been three months since I saw her and I haven't been back to the hospital since. When designing limos, there were three main aims really that uh, we wanted to put in place. Um, and the first was that it was a real patient-centred approach, which I hope Ivy showed. So there's a care plan, but that's very much focused around the patient, but engages everyone else who needs to know. Um, the team have, through the use of data sharing, have access to obviously the hospital record, but also the GP record following patient consent. So again, it really enables the patient to be kept at the, the center of, of care. And then that system-wide approach. Prior to the initiative, you'll have heard us um, describe that social workers often found themselves um, responsible for assessing people's needs. I don't think they particularly wanted that responsibility. I don't know when they got that responsibility and they didn't feel particularly well equipped to actually be the people that um, decided what people needed. So it was probably not a surprise that people would go into people's homes, they'd see medicines lying all over the place. The first and only solution that they knew how to think of was, oh, we'll put a, a blister pack in, and if that didn't work, like in Ivy's case, we'll get a care worker in. So we were taking people's independence a little bit more away, a little bit more quickly than we had to do. We also had a situation where care assistants often without adequate training, were given the responsibility for administering medication. Now, in our area, as in many others, the, the general historical practice, and it became really entrenched practice, was that they could only do this if the medication was put into a blister pack. And this was causing us all sorts of problems because there was also quite an entrenched belief that they weren't insured to help with medicines that were outside the blister pack. And of course, not everything can go into one of these blister packs. So things like inhalers, liquids, and creams, at best, district nurses were being called in however how many times a day to support. But at worst, they were just being totally ignored. And I was there at several safeguarding incidents where people just didn't see it as their responsibility, but didn't tell anyone and didn't do anything about it, and people ended up in hospital. So we decided as part of our pathway that we would change that and we made a decision across health and social care that if people were going to administer medication um, to others, if the care assistants were going to be involved in administration, they should do that from clearly labelled pharmacists' original packs and document what they've given on a MAR chart. Now, I remember at the time we introduced this idea, I was pretty much machine gunned by everybody in the room. I had to go away and lie down for a couple of hours. And people quite rightly had anxieties about the competence of staff to be able to do this. And it was how can you take responsibility away from staff who are often on the national living wage, who didn't have any qualifications? Um, how can you take it away from responsible professionals like pharmacists and give it to um, these care assistants? 
But we were being guided at the time by documentation that had come out from the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and I believe the Care Quality Commission that said it wasn't whether medication was in one of these blister packs or not that made life safer for patients. It was adequate training of the workforce and proper documentation. So we took care of the proper documentation by asking our community pharmacists, we commissioned a service so that um, community pharmacists produced medication administration records at the time they dispensed the medicines so we could ensure they were accurate and prevent transcription errors. And we commissioned some really good specialist medication administration training that we then delivered across social care, 20 staff at a time. It took us about 18 months to train about 1,200. But we still had to win hearts and minds. Now, I remember we used to always start off the training. We'd ask a community pharmacist to incorrectly fill one of these blister packs, a few of them. And we'd pass them round at the beginning of the session, gave everybody quite a bit of time. And we said, it's Tuesday evening, what would you give Mrs. Smith? And invariably, everybody went to the little slot Tuesday in the evening and said, I'd give these tablets. We counted for the first 700 staff that we trained to see how many people would spot that those dosset boxes were incorrectly filled. And I'll throw it open to you. How many people do you think picked up that there was a medication error? None. <laughs> Two. We stopped counting after that. But it seemed that we'd dumbed down the system so much that we'd stopped everybody from thinking. As Kath said, we wanted this model to be an interface model because if you're in hospital and you're transferring out and you're fair, you know, you know you've got the cognition, you've got your nearest and dearest, you have a good chance of figuring out what's been started, what's been stopped and what's been changed and why. When there's a third party involved, like the social care packages or you're going to a care home, I'm surprised it ever really works out. That's why we wanted that whole system approach. And um, I think I'd like to finish off by saying how well this pathway has been welcomed across health and social care. Everybody knew that there was problems with the way we were doing things. It's just that nobody knew how to fix it. I think giving um, people space and looking at getting the right people on the bus and the right people on the right place on the bus has helped us, we hope, to improve patient safety. We've got a little bit on outcomes to show you, um, and you're probably all sitting there thinking, how do you measure what you prevent, which was a massive challenge. I'm not going to read through the whole slide because we probably have about two minutes left, but we were quite successful in terms of trying to quantify for the first year what the service did. So we've got the number of patients seen, the number of interventions, but we also um, evaluated those interventions to calculate the number of hospital A&E attends that were prevented and admissions that, uh, that were prevented. We, we calculated the number of visits that were prevented by keeping people independent and not needing support from social care. Um, which gave you savings of about £600,000 per annum. But what that really matched to was the, um, the stats of the literature that says that for one every pound spent on delivering this type of pharmacy service, you can save two pounds across the health and social care environment. But in a way, I guess that's just what we can count rather than what does count. Um, and we hope that Ivy really showed that today. Thank you.